This morning we're continuing in Mark's gospel. If you would please turn to Mark chapter 8. Uh, when I um, tell the, uh, when, I, when I enter the, the bulletin information I, and decide to go one direction and change my mind at the last minute, I know it creates some difficulties for those up there. <laughs> Makes me rather reluctant to do it, but I've got to this morning, so I'm going to add just a few verses. What I'd like to do is, uh, instead of reading just verses 31 through 38, I'd like to begin back in verse 27, since this really is one whole event that's taking place here. So I'd like to begin in, in verse 27 of Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be looking though specifically at verses 31 through 38. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. And Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I read that uh, section that we looked at last week because I did want us to be reminded of a very important truth that comes from that text and that is that though we need to hear the gospel before we can be saved, and though we need to hear that gospel from another person, that is, God doesn't send angels into the world to witness to us, but he brings believers to us to, to bring that gospel, that by itself is not enough. The Father has to reveal his Son to us, he basically has to do a supernatural work by his Holy Spirit. When Jesus asked what others thought of him and the disciples told him, he then asked them what they thought. And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And in Matthew's gospel, he says, the son of the living God. And Jesus turns to Peter and says that you are blessed, Peter, because flesh and blood, that is man, did not reveal that to you. But my father who is in heaven. The Father has to reveal Jesus Christ to you in a supernatural way. He has to do the work of the new birth as we saw last week before you are going to be able to really see who Jesus Christ is. I mean there are a lot of other people who heard Jesus and who saw what he was doing but they were drawing erroneous conclusions. Even among those who might have known who he was they were rejecting him because the Father had not revealed who he was. The gospel has to come not only with word, but it has to come with power. It becomes the power of God to save when God empowers it by his Holy Spirit. And really without that work, the gospel can really only increase one's condemnation, sadly. Because if one hears the gospel and doesn't receive it because God isn't working by his Holy Spirit in it, that additional knowledge that one rejects is actually going to speak against them on the last day, which is why it's important that when we hear the gospel, we respond to it with faith and repentance. 
Now, you need to remember that if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that hearing the gospel is not enough to save you. Knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord and is Savior is not enough to save you. Believing that he is the Lord and Savior is not enough to save you. The Spirit has to make you alive. He has to open your eyes to see that which the world doesn't see. And that is that Jesus Christ is lovely, that he is glorious, that he's beautiful, that he is perfectly suited to be your Savior. If you don't see that, you're not going to reach out and trust him to save you. If the Lord hasn't opened your eyes, pray that God would do so because only Jesus Christ can save you. He is the only Savior of the world. And of course, we all need to remember, to remember this as we go out to evangelize. Telling people the gospel is not enough, though it is absolutely essential that we do tell them. The Spirit needs to be at work. And so we need to pray as well as share. Both of these things are necessary. You can pray all day long for someone for their salvation, but if they don't hear the gospel, they're not going to be saved. And you can speak the gospel to them all day long, but unless you pray for them that God would send His Spirit, they're still not going to be saved. You really need to, to do both. But let's be encouraged as well that God will work His will through His gospel. That God hasn't sent us on a fool's errand to go out and to speak all day long to people that He's going to allow to remain in darkness. He hasn't sent us out to leave us on our own or to accomplish nothing. But rather, he has sent us to proclaim his truth to others that he might gather his sheep together. And he will do that through us. He will accomplish exactly what it is that he intends. So you can know that none of your efforts are actually going to be in vain. They're not going to be wasted. The Lord has sent you out for a reason. Now, this morning we see, again, we're reminded again, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And as the Christ, Jesus says that he had to lay down his life. He had to sacrifice himself so that you and everyone who would put their trust in Jesus Christ would be saved, would live forever. Now, the Scriptures say that the Christ must suffer many things that he had to be rejected by Israel, by the leaders of Israel, by the elders, by the chief priests, by the scribes, that he had to be put to death, but that three days later he would rise again. Now, Jesus was telling his disciples that this was true. In no uncertain terms, he made it as plain as he possibly could. But notice that this is not what Peter wanted to hear. So Peter takes him aside and he begins to rebuke the Lord. God forbid it, Lord. In other words, Jesus, you're not going to do this. Lord, you can't do this. This will never happen to you. Well, Jesus turns and he looks at the disciples. And of course, they're waiting to hear what Jesus has to say. And so for their sakes, as well as for Peter's, he rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Now, why did Jesus say that? That would be kind of a startling thing to hear from anyone, but especially from your Lord and Savior, the one who knows the truth. Did Jesus say this because Peter was demon-possessed? Was it because Satan had possessed him? Well, I don't think we can assume that because Peter was a believer after all. And the Lord will not allow Satan to possess his people. Was it because Satan influenced Peter to say this? Well, that's certainly possible. Because Satan is working all the time to try to overthrow Christ and his kingdom. And he could have been working there. Undoubtedly, he was. If it wasn't that, it was certainly Peter's flesh. And that's something that we always need to be on our guard against. But I think that there's another reason why Jesus said this, perhaps a more obvious reason, and that is because Peter, in saying this, was actually acting like Satan. 
Remember what caused Satan's fall. He didn't want to do things the Lord's way. He didn't want to submit to his will. Uh, if I can mention the name Jonathan Edwards, sometimes uh, I'm made fun of because I do that, because I mention him so often. But he has a lot of, again, very helpful insights. Edwards believes that it's very possible that the reason why Satan and the angels fell, at least those angels that did, was because they didn't want to submit to God's will for their lives, which was that they would be the servants of those who would inherit salvation. Satan didn't want God's you know, way of doing things. He didn't want to do God's will. He wanted to do his own thing. That's why he rebelled and took a third of the angels with him. But you see, that's exactly what Peter was doing. Now, I think that Peter meant well, even though he rebuked his Lord. Perhaps he did this out of love because he didn't want to see Jesus killed. Perhaps, Peter thought, that Jesus, as many of the Jews believed, was going to take the, the command of Israel and lead them in rebellion against Rome and set the nation free. Many believed that that's what the Messiah was going to do. But whatever the reason might have been, Peter wanted this, but the Lord did not want this. He wasn't setting his mind on God's interests, as Jesus always did, but he was setting his mind on man's. Now let me ask you, isn't this perhaps the most difficult problem that we as believers have to face today? That we're more concerned about what it is that we want, what we want from the world, what we want for our lives, than what the Lord wants. You know, one thing I'm always asking myself, although I don't ask myself as often as I should, is why was the Lord able to accomplish the things that he was able to accomplish through men and women just like us, perhaps with similar gifts, perhaps with greater gifts, why was he able to accomplish so much more through certain individuals, such as John Wycliffe, or Martin Luther, or George Whitfield, or William Carey, than he does through us? Now, was it just because God called them to this particular work? Was that why they were able to do it? Well, you know that God calls other people to the same work, and there are many others who don't accomplish nearly as much as they do. Was it that the Lord gave them greater gifts? Certainly, we'd have to say that see, these are some of the most gifted men that God has ever given to the church. But hasn't he given gifts to each one of us? And have we used them as well as these used theirs? Or does God give gifts to his people only to have them perhaps wasted? Well, these things have something to do with it, calling, opportunity, and gifts. But there certainly is another reason why these individuals were able to do so much more than we do. And that's, that reason had to do with their hearts. It had to do with the choices that they made. They chose not to hold on to the world and the things of the world. They chose not even to hold on to their own lives. But they set their hearts on what the Lord wanted them to do. Now, for those of us struggling in this area this morning, and that really includes every single one of us to one degree or another, we need to see that Jesus' rebuke to Peter is also meant for us. I want you to note here that Jesus was speaking to his disciples, but Mark says that he was also addressing the crowd. So this applies to everyone from that point forward who would follow the Lord these things have to be true of them as well. They have to be true of you. You must set your heart on the Lord's interests and not your interests. As a matter of fact, the Lord tells you you have to do that if you're going to obtain heaven. Now, Jesus says this not because he wants to scold you, not because he wants to make things hard for you, but he says these things to you because he loves you and he wants what is best for you. But again, that doesn't make this any less serious. You do need to let go of the world. By the way, by the, in the world, Jesus is referring to the things we saw in 1 John chapter 2, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. And that includes a great part of the world. You need to let go of these things. 
Those who hold on to them will perish with the world when it perishes. But those who follow the Lord, those who let go of it and love the Lord and follow him without reservation will see heaven. Now this morning I want us to consider two things. If you want to save your life, Jesus says, if you want to live your life the way that you want to live it, rather than the way the Lord calls you to live it, you will lose it. And secondly, but if you lay down your life, if you deny yourself and follow Jesus, you will gain it. Now, first of all, Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you will lose it. And by saving your life, Jesus has in mind here, holding it back from him, using your life for what you want to do with it, seeking your own glory, the applause of the world, as we've seen in many cases in the Olympics. That's just one example. People glorying in their abilities. They've, they've gained that applause. They've got the medal. But if they've done that for themselves and not for the Lord, then they are holding on to their lives. When you do those things, rather than what the Lord wants you to do, that's holding on to your life, not dying to yourself, not picking up your cross, not following Him. If you pursue what you want in this world for yourself, Jesus says you will lose your life. And he's not here talking just about physical life. He's talking here about eternal life. You will lose out on eternal life. You will inherit eternal death. And the reason is because you would not submit to him and give your life to him. And by the way, this is the evidence that you are really converted, or, or really not converted, I should say. If you're unwilling to submit to the Lord, if you hold on to your life, if you embrace the world, that is evidence that you are not saved. Jesus isn't here giving you a formula of works to do. Do this work, let go of these things, do these things, and you're going to be saved. But he is giving you the evidence of how you can know that you're saved if you're willing to give up those things. Again, as uh, Greg already reminded us, the, uh, the picture of passion and patience in Pilgrim's Progress is very much along these same lines. Passion wanted the world. He wanted his inheritance now, and God appears to have an inheritance for all of his children, even those who are unconverted, because every person who exists in the world today is in some sense a child of God in that God created them. God has an inheritance for them as well. They can have their portion of the world, and they can perish in hell, or they can be like patience who waits for the best things which are coming ahead. And so he lets go of the world, doesn't embrace these things, but instead waits for the world to come. Well, that's what the Lord says you need to do. Passion was unconverted. Patience was converted. And the evidence that he was was that he was willing to wait. He was willing to wait for that glory in the world to come rather than seeking it here. So the Lord says if you hold on to your life, and you seek to gain as much glory, as much possession, as much power, whatever it may be in this world for yourself, you might gain those things, but you'll lose something much more precious. Now, on the other hand, he says, if you lay down your life, you will gain it. And by laying down your life, picking up your cross and following him, basically he means this, completely surrendering yourself to him, to love him, to honor him, to serve him with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with all your strength throughout your life. If you are willing to pursue his glory in this world, then Jesus says you will gain your life. You will gain eternal life. Again, not something that you earn, but something that you show that you have by the grace of God. Now, understand what Jesus doesn't mean by this. He doesn't mean that you shouldn't pursue an education. He doesn't mean that you shouldn't get a job. He doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do the very best that you can possibly do in the field that you've chosen to pursue. But what he means is that you must choose a profession or a vocation, you know, a job, that is lawful, something that is good, something that isn't sinful, something that he commands you to do, 
There's a broad range of things that fall into that category. Most jobs do. Something that is helpful to your neighbor and to mankind in general. And then having chosen that job, you seek to do the very best that you could possibly do to honor him in it. And to try to bring as many people as you can that you come in contact with to Christ through the gospel. That you try to draw attention to the Lord for the things that you're able to accomplish. I mean, as you, you labor in this particular vocation and the Lord gives you success, don't just pat yourself on the back and become prideful over it. Because that's the world's boastful pride of life. But give God all the glory for whatever you're able to accomplish rather than to yourself. Now, if you do this, if you give your life to him, if you submit to him, if you live for him rather than for yourself, you will show yourself to be a true believer. You will inherit heaven. It sounds uh, simple enough, but our Lord doesn't leave it there. He does give a couple of reasons now why you should do this, why you should lay your life down, why you should die to yourself in this world, why you should follow him instead. He asks the question, what if you did decide to go after the world? What if you became very successful? What if you were able to accomplish what a few men actually tried to accomplish in the history of this world? What if you gained the world? Nobody actually ever gained the whole world, but they tried. Hitler tried. Napoleon tried, and certainly kings of Persia tried, and Alexander the Great, and Caesars in Rome, and so forth. And perhaps there are people today who would still aspire to be the king of the world. But let's say that you actually gained it. Let's say you possessed the world. What would you really have gained? If you did, realizing that everything that you ever achieved, everything that you worked your whole life actually to get, all the riches, all the fame, and all the fortune, everything one day will be lost. I mean, for those people who possessed a great deal of the world, such as Alexander the Great, Caesars, and so forth, Napoleon, Hitler, where are they today? What do they have today to show for their work? These are things that are only for this life, and they are not for the life to come. You can't take them with you. So that in the end, you will lose everything. And so you've actually gained nothing. What else, though, does Jesus say that you will lose in the process if you gain the world? He says you will lose your immortal soul. To gain the world, you also have to give this up. You not only lose the world, but you forfeit your soul as well. And how much is your soul worth? What is your soul worth to you? I think um, maybe some of us have been um, tainted, maybe not, by uh, just the idea that um, I think it was in was it Faustus or something like that where... He sells his soul to the devil. It almost seems to be like this part of him that he can do without. Not that important. I don't need it anyway. You know, you can have it. I'll give it up so I can have something I really want. You do need to realize that your soul is you. It is something you would notice if it was gone because it is your personality. It is the part of you that thinks, the part of you that feels and makes decisions. You see, when the Lord says you lose this, he doesn't mean it's actually taken away from you. It means that you become lost. You are lost forever in hell. And by the way, I think he means more than just the soul here. Sometimes the word soul refers to the whole person. And the person who tries to gain the world and loses their soul loses not just their soul, which is the most important part, but you lose your body as well. Body and soul in hell hell. And the question you need to ask yourself is, is the world worth that much to you? Jonathan Edwards once wrote this, quote, the damned would be ready to give the world, if they could, to have the number of their sins to have been one less, that is one less than they actually did commit and are now suffering for. The damned would give the world 
if they could just be relieved of the suffering of one sin. Now, in this world, they gladly gave their souls to gain as much of the world as they possibly could gain. But in the torment of that world to come, they would gladly give the whole world just to reduce the punishment of their sentence by one sin. So the question is, is the world really worth the loss of your soul? And Jesus goes on to say that if you believe it is, and by doing that, of course, he means, well, that's what he means here when he says, if you are ashamed of him, if you prefer the world over Jesus, if you lack the courage to stand up, stand up for him in the face of the world, then he will be ashamed of you. If you choose not to follow him, he will choose not to own you. He will choose not to stand up for you. On the day that is coming, in which he will judge all men, if you choose the world over him, you will lose your soul, and Jesus will disown you on that day. Uh, that's a, a very great price to pay for something that most people, the vast majority of the people of this world, will not even gain. Most of the people of this world are seeking the things of the world, but they're going to gain so little of it by the time they're done, but they're going to pay a great price for what little they gain, and they're going to lose that in the end, and of course, they're going to lose their souls. Now, every day, you and I are faced with a choice, and the choice is between the world and Jesus. Now, which do you choose? As we've considered the end of both of these roads, which road are you choosing on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, we realize that no Christian is perfect. No Christian is going to choose for the Lord perfectly every time. As a matter of fact, if you're a believer here this morning, you realize that you fail every single day. Every single day you do choose a part of the world over Jesus Christ, but you also know that as a Christian, every day you repent of making that choice. We all fail in many different ways. But you also know this, that as a Christian, you cannot ever choose the world over Jesus Christ. At least consistently and throughout your life, you can't do that because the Lord will not allow you to do that because he's put his love in your heart and you love him too much. If you're a Christian this morning, that is what you were like. Yes, we're all tempted by the world, but we don't embrace the world. Sometimes we fall, but we don't fall entirely away from the Lord. We don't just dive into the world and go after all that that's there. But we do falter and we do repent. That describes a true Christian. But what about the, the unbeliever? Does this describe you? That on a consistent basis, you do choose the world over Jesus. And when you make that choice, you don't repent. You continue to go after it, and you want more and more of it. You're hoping to gain more of the, uh, well, the applause of the world, more fame, more fortune. Uh, you want that recognition. That's what you're after. Well, the Lord says if that is what you choose on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than him, that he is going to choose not to own you on that day, the day when you will need him the most, and that is the day that you stand before him and give account of your life. On that day, you will lose your immortal soul. So consider, Jesus says this morning, what the world costs, what it's going to cost you, and choose life instead of death. Give the Lord your life. Choose to serve him. Trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can do this. And turn away from your sins. If you do that, the Lord will own you on that day as his child. And he will openly receive you and give you honor, that applause that you wanted. He will give you that honor, honor that will last forever. Well, may the Lord grant that each of us would choose by his grace, the right path, that we'd make the right choices and choose Jesus over the world. 
let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us make that choice.